high schoolers, open up your Bible with me to 1 John chapter 2, please. 1 John chapter 2. Um, this actually was not supposed to happen. Just look, look around real quick. Just look around. And if, if you haven't been coming here for a while, uh, we actually just decided to multiply into two different services. We have a, a middle school service on Sunday night, a high school service, just you guys on Wednesday night. And, and we decided it was going to make some space for us, but now the building's already almost full again. I mean, it's, it's incredible because y'all are loving Jesus, coming here, worshiping him, and, and just doing our thing. We still have a couple rows open, some more seats. I, I just want to remind you, don't let a full building discourage you. Don't let a full building discourage you from bringing your friends because we will, we will do whatever it takes to fit in as many teenagers in here as possible to hear and to learn more about Jesus because he's what we're all about. So we still got some rows. We still got chairs here and there. We got a balcony up top that still holds 30 people. So if you ever just want to bring your whole team, if you ever just want to bring a bunch of friends or whatever, get them here and we will find a place to put them. I promise. I promise you. First John chapter two, uh, we are going to talk about the devil again tonight. Um, not because we're weird. You don't hear a lot of churches talking about the devil unless they're weird. A lot of weird churches do talk about the devil a lot more so than Jesus, but we talk about the devil in such of a way that we understand him through Jesus only. Now, when I was in college, which is most of my stories, uh, when I was in college, I worked at a camp, and one cool thing that we did at a camp is we took teenagers to these huge sand dunes. Now, you've been to Gulf Shores, you've seen sand dunes that are like four, five, six, if it's crazy, like eight feet high. The sand dunes that we would take them to in Michigan were over 400 feet high, all right? 400 foot sand dunes, and it was amazing. In fact, go ahead and put the first picture of the sand dune up there, Taylor, if you would. This is actually, you can see people like super tiny at the top. This is actually the smaller sand dune to get over to go to the bigger sand dunes. So we would take them to the smaller sand dune, and you, you have to hike up this sucker, and it was, it was terrible. Go, go to the next picture for me. Um, the next picture, here's, here's one of the kids trying to get back up the sand dune. As you can see, um, how, how wide it is right there. It's almost that wide at the bottom. It's just that far down. That is still known as one of the kitty or the kindergarten or the wussy sand dunes. Go to the next one. This is the next one. Yeah, this is a kid having some fun on the sand dunes, of course. Um, it, that, that's a pretty flat spot. A lot of the sand dunes, it was a much sharper grade, um, pretty much like a 45-degree angle, um, pretty much straight down. Go to the next one for me, please. This is kind of like the bigger sand dunes. That is actually Lake Michigan there at the bottom. And so this is around probably about a quarter of the way down. And if you can see, it just goes all the way down to where you could, you, you could not literally even see people down there at the bottom because you are up so high in this picture. 400 feet. I mean, it was, it was amazing to start at the top at 400 feet, and you could literally just start running down this sand dune for 400 feet, and, and you would not, it was longer than a football field, you would not stop. I mean, you would not stop. You could not stop because you'd be going so fast. I remember I was taking a step maybe like once every 10 feet. I felt like a deer. You know what I'm saying? Like just stepping, and then I'd step again because not only are you jumping out, but it's so far down. It, it was the feeling of flying. I was running as fast as I could down the sand dune, and if you ever miss a step and start to roll, you just ball up because you just keep rolling down the sand dune, and, and it was, and you could, you could people, again, people were doing flips on it and stuff like that, and you would get down to the bottom, you could go into Lake Michigan and just kind of cool off and refresh and everything, but then you had the hike back up. What took you 45 seconds to go down? Because it was such a steep grade going back up, it usually took anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes to get back up. 30 and 45 minutes. As you can see in this picture, people, you're on your hands and your feet, literally using everything you can to climb back up this thing. And it's terrible. It's terrible because for every two steps you take up, you slide one back down the entire time. So you take two up and you slide one down because of sand. If you've never been in sand, you're a loser, first of all. Second of all, it is a very slick substance, right? And so you, you go up and then you take a step down, you take two steps up, you slide back down a step, and it takes forever. I even heard 
heard stories where they had to, had to bring in helicopters to rescue people like the old fat ladies that could not get up this thing because they literally, they, they, they could, I'm, I'm literally like older ladies, from what I heard, some people have had heart attacks trying to get up it because it is so strenuous to get back up. What is so much fun to go down? What is so much fun to experience it is so much hard work to get back up. So much hard work to get back up. It's the same thing with your sin. Sin can be so fun. Sin can be, and I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm saying that, sin can be so fun. Sin can be very pleasurable. Sin can be and is often enjoyable, the Bible says, just for a season, just for a short time. But when you have gone down the slippery slope of sin to where you enjoyed the experience of your own personal pleasurable sin and you find yourself at the bottom, hitting rock bottom in your life, it will take so much work to get back up to the top. In fact, when you have sin in your life, and you're trying to walk with Jesus with sin in your life, you will find every two steps you take forward, you will be sliding back at least a step because it holds us back. We cannot keep in step, keep in pace with Jesus. And so what I want to show you tonight is something that I'm shocked. I literally am surprised that I don't hear this preached more because it is so clear, it is so helpful, it is so evident in Scripture what Satan is up to. We're going to talk about Satan's strategy to get you to sin. And it's something Satan has been doing for thousands of years. We don't know how long the world necessarily has been in existence. Somewhere around thousands of years from what we can tell biblically, Satan has been doing this. John is going to tell us what Satan is doing. Then we're going to go back to Genesis and see how Satan tempted Eve in that same way. And then we're going to go to the life of Jesus. Because here's the deal. Like I told you last week, we have an enemy. This life is not a game. This life is a war. And in this life of war, our enemy is out to destroy us. And we talked about last week, our enemy is a deceiver. Now you look and you listen to me right now. Look at me right now. Our enemy is such a deceiver that one of his best lies is, is that he doesn't exist. One of our enemy's best lies for your life is that he doesn't exist he doesn't matter, he doesn't have power over you, and he's not a big deal. He is a huge deal. He knows who you are. He knows your weaknesses. He knows where you are susceptible. He knows where you are going to fall. He knows where he can tempt you the most. So we have to make sure that we pay very close attention to our enemy as we fight against him, but also as we're fighting for our king, as we're fighting for our king. If you remember, uh, we talked about a couple weeks ago with the whole storyline of angels, where did angels come from as we're in the series, angels, Satan, and demons. Angels, when did God create them? God created them at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Somewhere around there where it says that God created the heavens, in there is where God created the angels. You can write it down. We, we have before. Job 38, verses 6, 7, and 8 talk about how the angels shouted for joy when God was creating the earth. So God creates the heavens first, including the angels, and the angels watched God create and worshiped God. Lucifer, who is now Satan, who is the devil, was one of those good angels. Lucifer was good. When God was done creating on that sixth and seventh day, God looked at his creation and said, it is very good. It is very good, including his angel, Lucifer. But something happened to where Lucifer, what it looks like in scripture, that he, he got mad. 
He got prideful. He was watching how God was creating everything for the glory of Jesus, how everything was pointing back to Jesus. And so Lucifer is watching this, and and, and he sees that the earth, he sees that the the plants, he sees that the water, he sees that the animal kingdom, he sees that the all of the outer space, he sees that the people are all created to worship and to bring glory to Jesus Christ. And Lucifer did not like that. It looks like that he got jealous he got prideful so he wanted to put himself in the place of Jesus and so he goes down to the earth he deceives Eve and Adam into sinning to follow him rather than to follow God Lucifer becomes sinful Adam and Eve become sinful the entire earth becomes sinful and cursed and that's where it all gets started that's where Satan has come from So last week, if you didn't get to hear it, we talked about the identity of Satan, how he's a murderer, how he's a liar, how he is the Antichrist, how he is all these different things. You can go on our podcast on iTunes or YouTube and watch the video. If you want to see it, that's where all of our sermons are. You can check it all out. Tonight, I want to talk with you about Satan's strategy. This Satan. There are three simple, clear ways that Satan seeks to get you to sin. Check it out. First John. First John chapter 2. Before we go there, go ahead and put the scripture on the screen for me. Taylor, if you would. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 says this. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Paul is saying, here's what Paul is saying. God is telling Satan's little dirty secrets. All of his dirty little secrets, God is revealing. Satan doesn't have many secrets. It's kind of like Victoria. She don't have many secrets. You know, there's nothing left to hide, right? And so Satan doesn't have, I should not have said that, I'm sorry. Uh, This is why we have a high school service, by the way. I I can't get away with that in middle school. Um, Satan does not have any secrets. God has revealed them all. God has shown them all the secrets to us so we cannot be outwitted. We cannot be outsmarted because we are not ignorant of his designs or we are aware of the way that Satan works. Is that true about you? Do you know how Satan works in your life to get you to sin against God? Have you picked up on this in your life? Have you seen your weaknesses? Have you seen where you are not strong, where where you can easily be attacked? Temptation. Temptation is how Satan does it. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. I, I didn't do this with the middle school. Let me show you something real quick before we get to 1 John 2. Look at James chapter 1. Just turn to the left. Just a, just a book or two, go past the Peters, James 1, verse 14. Let me just show you something about temptation really quickly. I want to show you how temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. Verse 14. Verse 14 says, y'all good? Y'all there? James 1, 14, good to go? All right, here we go. It says, but each person is tempted. Each person is tempted when he or she is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So he says that there is a temptation and then a sin. Temptation leads to sin and sin leads to death. So here's what we need to do. You are going to be tempted. We can't help it. We are sinners. We are naturally going to be tempted by Satan. By the way, we're tempted in three different ways. We're tempted by our own flesh because we are sinners. Sin is not just something outside of us. Sin is within us. Sin, we are sinners. That, that's, that's who we are because we've been cursed. Sin is within us. So that's first is our flesh. Secondly is um, the world. People around, they tempt us to sin. Some, some of you, if you're by yourself, you, you may not sin a whole lot by yourself because your flesh is not quite as tempting as the world when you're around other people you want to sin all the time. Other people, they're pretty strong when they're around others, when they're around the world, but their flesh is what brings them down all the time. But the Bible talks about a third temptation, a third temptation, which is a satanic, demonic temptation. 
that is spiritual warfare. That is literally the angelic evil spirits come and they tempt us with sin to drag us, to lure us, to entice us, and to pull us away from Jesus Christ. So temptation is not sin. You need to understand that. So we resist temptation so that we do not sin. But most of the time, what we call temptation really is sin. Such as when you say about that, when you say about that guy, I just can't stand him. I am so tempted to walk up to him, grab his hair, pull him closer, beat his face in. And I, I just, I have this temptation to see blood come out from his nose. I have this temptation to rearrange his, his eye and his ear. I just want to swap places with each other. And, and I, I, I literally just, I want to beat his face in. I am so tempted. I am so tempted to beat the crap out of him. You're not tempted. You're sinning right? That is not temptation. That is sin. That is hatred. That is, is, is taking the thoughts of temptation and running with them and thinking on them. That is not temptation. You have moved on at that point from temptation to sin. I was going to give an illustration, another one, but I think it's inappropriate, so I'm not going to go there. Here we go. First John chapter 2. Wisdom has prevailed. Wisdom has prevailed. So here we go. First John 2 verse 15 says this says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, which is the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, all of these things are not from the Father, but they are from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So it says right there, I mean, very clear, very plain, very simple. Do not love the world, but love God the Father. Very simple. Do not be like the world, be like God. Here's the problem. A lot of people take that verse and they're always telling you, don't be worldly. Don't be like the world. Don't do what the world does. Don't look like how the world looks. Don't talk like how the world talks. Don't be like how the world is. And they get that verse wrong. That verse does not mean don't look like the world. That verse does not mean don't wear what they wear. That verse does not mean don't listen to what they listen to. That verse does not mean don't say the things they say. It does not mean that. That passage right there, the world, is not talking about people. That passage, the world, is talking about the evil system of Satan. So he's not talking about culture. He's not saying, Christians, be weirdos. Christians, be lame nerds and wear blue jean jumpers and keep your hair in a bun all the time. And guys, in the Bible, Leviticus says, white button-up shirts all the way to the top, tucked into your denim wrangler jeans and penny loafers all the time. The Bible never says that. It doesn't say, be weird. It doesn't say be weird. It, can I say that one more time? It doesn't say be weird. What it's talking about is don't get involved in the sinfulness of the world when it involves all those things. Don't get involved in the sinful language. Don't get involved in immodest clothing. Don't get involved in, in sinful behavior of the world. Because here's what he says. Here's what he says. Notice what he says. He points out what the world is. He's not saying culture. He's not saying what's popular. Look at what he says. He says, the world is, in verse 16, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three big temptations of Satan on your life. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let me show you. Taylor, go ahead and throw that up there for me. The desires of the flesh, what he's talking about that we need to stay away from. The desires of the flesh says, I want to feel that. I want to feel that. This is a temptation of Satan, a strategy of Satan to get you to sin, to say, I want to feel that. For instance, I want to feel that a sin, let's just go there, sexual pleasure. Sexual 
pleasure outside of marriage. Sex is not bad. Sex is not wrong. Sex is not unbiblical within marriage. Sexual pleasure outside of marriage is sinful. And so Satan tempts teenagers today to want to experience sexual pleasure in in innumerable ways, uncountable ways, un- unbelievably dip- Y'all are making up stuff, you know what I mean? To, for for in, in sexual sin, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what this culture is doing, this generation that the last did not. It's crazy what Satan is doing in, in this realm of, of sexuality. And God is saying, he's saying teenagers, Satan is coming and he's deceiving. He's tricking you into thinking that it is okay to feel sexual pleasure before marriage and it is a lie. In fact, not only is it a lie, it is destructive. That Satan is using this to destroy you, to destroy your purity, to destroy your conscience, to destroy your relationship with your future spouse. He's doing it to destroy you. He's lying. He's deceiving. He wants to hurt you. Sexual pleasure. I want to feel that. Satan uses that. Next, we think about things of consumption. Think about illegal drugs. Illegal drugs. You can just write this down. This isn't like the second column yet. Illegal drugs. Think about consumption, but you can write it down. Illegal drugs where people want to feel the high. They want to feel the rush. They want to feel the upper. They want to feel the downer. They, or you can go with legal, legal, over-the-counter stuff that people get hooked on. People get hooked all the time on sleeping pills. People get hooked all the time on triple C's. People get hooked all the time on all kind of over-the-counter drugs or, or just pharmaceutical drugs because they constantly want to feel something. And everybody wants to feel something different. Some people want to feel awake. Some people want to feel tired. Some people feel, want to feel like they're dreaming. Others want to feel whatever. Alcohol. Alcohol. Satan fools, deceives teenagers and is saying, just drink this. Just drink your life away and you will feel amazing. You will feel a buzz. You will feel alive. You will feel like you are just ready to party all night long. And it is a temptation coming from the evil one to wreck your life. Self-harm and self-abuse. We did a whole sermon on this. If you, if you struggle with this or have a friend that struggles with this, it's on YouTube. We did it months ago. So many t- teenagers use self-harm, cutting, poking, scratching, what, lacerating, whatever. There's so many different options that teenagers are into today with self-harm and self-abuse. Some teenagers do it so that they, they check to see if they're still alive because they feel so numb in this life. Some teenagers do it because their emotional pain is so deep, they need to feel something stronger than than their emotional pain, and so they cut themselves up to feel a physical pain that outweighs their emotional pain. So many different options that Satan uses to say, don't you want to feel this? Don't you want to feel this? Some people are just lazy. They just don't ever want to feel tired. And so they sleep and they sleep and they sleep or they go to school and they're lazy, they get home, they never study, they don't work hard, they don't do any work or chores around the house, they make mom and dad do absolutely everything, they won't get out and cut the grass, they won't get out and wash, they won't stay in and wash the dishes, they won't clean up, they won't do anything because they never want to work, they always want to live life for themselves, they want to feel comfortable, they want to feel lazy, they don't want to be tired, that is a deception of Satan. Satan does this? Let's just be very clear. Satan does this in your life because he does not want you to feel Jesus. He doesn't want you to feel the peace of Christ. He doesn't want you to feel the love of Christ. He doesn't want you to feel the joy of Christ. He doesn't want you to feel the awesome feeling that we get as we are following Jesus in purity. So he wants to take away that feeling and focus it on something else because we're human beings that are created to feel. Next, we gotta do these quickly. Desires of the eyes. The desires of the eyes say, I want to have that. Some people are driven. 
This is very tempting, I think, for most everybody, driven by materialism, driven by always wanting something new, something else, something better. You got to have the new clothes that come out. You got to have the new uh, Apple product. I'm preaching to myself here. You got to have the new Apple product that comes out, the new iPod, the new iPhone, the new whatever. You've got to have, have, have to where your life goal, by the way, it's, it's not wrong to have things. I want y'all to know that. We are not some kind of lame legalistic church that says you can only spend this much money and everything else goes to missions. We do believe in giving to missions. We love the gospel and we want to do everything we can to mobilize missionaries and to pay ourselves to go on mission trips to get to the other foreign countries so that we can tell them about Jesus. But it's okay to have nice things as long as nice things don't drive you. As long as nice things don't drive you. If you are someone that is driven, that you have to have these things. If your focus in life to get through high school, to get through college, to go to graduate school, and to get the best job so that you can have the biggest house in the neighborhood, so that you can get your dream car, so that you can provide everything for your family later on that your kids will not have any needs, will not have any wants, that you'll be able to give them everything they've ever wanted because you want everything you've ever wanted. If that's your goal, if that's your desire, you are materialistic. You are driven by the desires of the eyes of Satan that when you see it, you want it, and you have to have it, and it consumes you. God gives us nice stuff. He gives us nice cars. He gives us nice houses. He provides for our needs. But we are not to be driven, consumed by having stuff. This world is not about stuff, and Satan knows that we are a people who wants stuff, and so he tempts us to constantly want more, bigger, better stuff. And you've got to see that in your life, how Satan is working in you and on you to deceive you rather than saying, I want more of Jesus. I want to use the stuff that God has given me for the glory of Jesus. I want to use my stuff on other people. I want to have a nice house so I can bring people over, or I will settle with a, an average house so I can have people over so I can provide for them and talk with them and just share Jesus with them. Had an eighth grade girl come up to me a couple weeks ago, an eighth grade girl, eighth grade that said, Pastor Ship, will you pray for me? I want to have my friends over. I want to invite unsaved, unchurched friends over on a Friday night, have a spend the night party just so I can share Jesus with them. Just so, I, just so I can share the gospel with them. She wants to use her stuff for the glory of Christ. Last one, the pride of life. The pride of life says, I want to be that. The people that Satan tricks and fools and deceives with the pride of life, they are constantly thinking of themselves as the center of the universe. They want to be popular. They want to be known. They want to be respected. They want to be thought of. They want to be successful. They want to do it through sports. They want to do it through academics. They want to do it through the church. There are people that come to church because they want to be seen as religious. They want to be seen as spiritual. Their presence in the church is about them and not about Jesus. They do it through all different kinds of things. And just because I don't call yours out doesn't mean you're off the hook. Don't just be listening for, is he going to mention my sin? Oh, thank you, Jesus, he didn't, I guess I'm okay. No, you're messed up too. We're all messed up. I, I, I hear a pastor say this all the time, one of my favorite preachers, and, and so I, I love to say it. We are all messed up, jacked up people, and we come to a place and get together as mass, messed up, jacked up people to worship the one who is not messed up, who is not jacked up, who is Jesus. We worship him because he's perfect, he's holy, he's righteous, he's good, and so he's our focus. We don't want you to be a fake. We don't want you to be a phony. We want you to share your sin with us. We want to help you. 
This is the one place that we want you to feel comfortable to be you. This is the one place that we want you to be like, I can actually share my faults, my screw-ups, my secrets, and I can get help here. We have small group leaders. We have, we have two small group leaders over every age, every, every age, every gender. So if you're a 10th grade girl, there are two ladies in our youth ministry that are assigned to 10th grade ladies. Two ladies assigned to 10th grade girls that will be there for you at any time. If you ever need to talk, if you ever need counseling, if you ever need someone just, just to talk to on the phone, if you have things to confess or just, just, you just need some answers. For every grade, for every gender in our student ministry, we have people for you. I'm here for you. Satan is a tempter. We are sinners. We mess up and we need to be able to be honest. Let me show you how Satan does it. Look, turn back with me to Genesis chapter three. Let me just show you how he does it with Eve, how he does it with Jesus, and we'll be done. Genesis 3. Now, I read Genesis 3 to you last week. We talked about who, who Satan is last week. All through Genesis, he's the deceiver, he's the enemy, and so on, and so on, and so on. Remember that this is where everything is perfect, right? This is where God's created everything. You got perfect man, you got perfect woman in a perfect garden, perfect paradise. Everything is good. And then a snake slithers in, a, a supposedly good snake, snake slithers in up past Adam to Eve, which was purposeful. He is, he is perverting gender roles here. He's slithering up past Adam to Eve to deceive Eve. And remember, he, he deceives her into thinking, Eve, you can eat all this fruit in the garden. Everything you could ever want is here in the garden. Everything you need is here, but God said you cannot eat from just one of the thousands of trees around. One of the thousand. Eve, can you imagine what it would be like to eat from that tree? Can you imagine what you will experience, what God is holding out on you, how God is, he's, he's keeping something from you. He doesn't want you to encounter this. He doesn't want you to experience this. Sure, you can have whatever you want. Sure, this is the only thing that God is holding back. But if you just get that, if you just have this one thing, life is going to be so much better. I mean, honestly, how often does Satan do that to us? There is so much good so much good that God gives us all the time. So many things that we can do with our life. So many things that we can enjoy. But we tend to focus on the stuff that we can't do. We tend to focus on, God, that's against the Bible. And so I can't have any fun as a Christian because everybody else is doing it. And they're, they're smiling. They're laughing. They're falling over drunk. Surely they're having fun. Why can't I enjoy this? Why can't I do this with them, right? I want to see pink elephants too. What's the big deal? I want to enjoy this stuff. Why can't I do this? And Satan is saying, yeah, God wants you to have fun, but there's some stuff out there that's a lot more fun. If you could just experience that, then you will live life. Then you will experience life. So Eve takes the fruit off the tree. And she looks at it, and look at, we, we get to read her thoughts. Look at what God tells us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, let's stop right there. Eve sees that the tree, the fruit there, is good for food. If you look up here, the deception of Eve, first of all, it is good for food. It is good for food. So we put it in columns so I can show you it's good for food, which fits into the temptation of the flesh, that she wants to feel it. Sure, she's eaten the other fruit. Sure, she has tasted of the grapes. Sure, she has tasted of the bananas. Sure, she's had the pomegranates. I don't know. You know, she, she, she's had the fruit. But has she had this one? No. She sees, hey, this will be good for food too. This will be good for me. So it's a, it's a, she, she is, she's experiencing, check this out. She's experiencing the desires of the flesh. She's, it's, it's, I want to feel that. Now reading on, she says, so when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. So next, delight to the eyes. Satan is tempting her in all three ways here. Good for food, delight to the eyes. She looks at it, it looks good. A lot of times we look at sin and it looks fine. It looks like it's not, gonna, it's not a big deal. It looks like God's overreacting. God is really just, he's a party pooper. 
God does not want us to have a great time, and so he wants us to be lame until we get to heaven, and then hopefully we'll have a good time there. That's not how God rolls. That's not how God works. God actually knows what he's doing. Sin does look good, but sin is destructive. And then it goes on to say, so it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. So she took of its fruit and ate it and also gave some to her husband who was with her. So good for food, delight to the eyes, and make one wise. Here's what Satan was telling her. Satan was saying, Eve, if you eat this fruit, you will know the difference of good and evil, which was true. Satan was not lying there. She knew the difference of good and evil once she ate the fruit. And then he said, you will become like God. Every time we sin, we sin because we want to become like God. And you might be thinking, Chip, I've never wanted to be like God. Dude, what are you talking about? I've never thought to myself, I want to become like God. Yes, you do. Because you, want to make up the laws and the rules and the commands in your own life, what is good for me and what is bad for me. What is right for me, what is wrong for me. What is safe for me, what is destructive for me. If you want to take that place away from God and you make up your own rules, your own life, then you are saying, I want to be my own God. I want to be my own God. Let God be God. That's revolutionary right there. Let God be God. Let, let him, God's been around a long time. I think it's called forever, right? It's, it's eternal. He's always been around. He knows what's up. He created us. He's been watching this stuff for thousands of years and intimately involved in all of this. God knows what's up. God knew what was going to happen. Now check this out. God knew what was going to be happening in your life when he wrote his word. He knew, even though this was written thousands of years ago, he knew the sin and temptation that you would be going through when he wrote this, and this is just as true for us today as it was for them thousands of years ago. Timeless truth. Timeless. It doesn't matter if they had TVs back then. It doesn't matter if they, if they didn't have internet back then. It doesn't matter if they didn't have pornographic websites back then. It doesn't matter if teenagers were able just to hop from house to house and and make out whenever they wanted to back then. They couldn't because they would be stoned. It doesn't matter what they were able to do. They went through the same temptations that we are going through as well. And God is giving us timeless truths throughout all generations that this will be just as true thousands of years from now when people are probably even more jacked up, screwed up than we are. This is timeless. This is good. John reveals it to us. We see how it was true with Eve. Now let's see how it was true with Jesus. Real quick, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. Does the same thing with Jesus. Matthew 4, verse 1 says this. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was tempted with sin. This is huge for us. Jesus was not some fake. He was not some phony. He wasn't just God that took on a human bod and came down to the earth and just was never tempted with sin because he's fully God. And, and he just went into the cross and he died. And, and it was just this all big act of God to show us how much he loves us. Jesus was literally tempted with sin. He was tempted with sin. But he never sinned. Totally, perfectly resisted sin at all times. So then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting, which means he did not eat, he just prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. For a month and 10 days, he fasted, did not eat, only prayed. He was hungry. 
That's the biggest overstatement in the Bible. Yeah. He tried skipping four meals. He skipped 40 days. He was hungry. I mean, it's just, it just makes sense. Starving, you know. Get an infomercial about him and, and start giving some money. Feed this guy. <laughs> 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, so G the devil came to Jesus and said, if you are the son of God, so he's tempting him. If, Jesus, if you really say you're the son of God like you say that you are, why don't you command these stones to become loaves of bread? Because he was hungry. By the way, Satan knew where Jesus would be tempted most. And so Satan used bread. He used stones to bread. As you can see up here, stones to bread. Satan is using the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. I want to feel that. Jesus wants to feel food. Jesus wants to feel like he's been satisfied, fulfilled. He doesn't want this hungry feeling anymore. Right? He wants to feel full. And so Satan comes up. Satan knows where you're going to be tempted. Satan has been watching you. His demons have been spying on you. They know where your weaknesses are. They know where to tempt you. And they'll come up to you and say, you know, you think you're such a good person? If you're such a good person, then why don't you do this? And look at, look at how Jesus responds. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is not just Jesus talking. That is Jesus reciting a Bible verse. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Jesus was able to resist temptation and the devil because he knows the word of God. It's not really fair. Jesus is the word of God. He's got a little advantage on us, but Jesus knows God's word. He knows God's word. The best way that you are going to resist sin, resist temptation, is by knowing God's word. When you're tempted with desires of the flesh, that you know verses that you can bring up in your mind, reminding yourself that it's wrong. Desires of the eyes and the pride of life. Verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, Jesus, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. This is Psalm 91. By the way, Satan is quoting the Bible. The devil knows the Bible. The devil will play tricks on your mind about the Bible. You may come back with a Bible verse to Satan, and he may twist it around on you and say, yeah, I, I, that's really cute. You memorized that, Nuana. Awesome job. But does that really mean what it says? Maybe the Greek or the Hebrew is different. Maybe, maybe that was just contextual. Maybe it was just situational. And you'll be like, oh, my gosh, maybe you're right, devil. And so and then you'll fall into sin, right? <laughs> You, you got to be ready. He's good. He knows the stuff. He knows the Bible. He's quoting Psalm 91, and so Jesus comes back to him and says, again, notice Jesus keeps quoting Scripture. Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He's talking here, angels' protection. Angels' protection. He's saying, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, how about you just show everybody? You throw yourself off the temple. They don't believe you. They want to kill you. They want to beat you. They want to rearrange your face, Jesus. So if you just get up to the top of the temple, throw yourself off, we know all you have to do is speak a command. The devils will, um, not the devils, wow, the angels, you know, flutter in and they'll save you. Wouldn't it be also, he's saying, that desire of the eyes, that you want to have that. Don't you want angelic protection rather than going through suffering? Rather than going through the suffering of this life, wouldn't, wouldn't you rather have angelic protection? Verse 7, Jesus said again, it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 8, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And the devil said to him, all these kingdoms I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, poof be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Satan is getting him, trying to get him with the pride of life, saying, Jesus, you could be the king of the world. Jesus is not the king of the world at this point. He's not the king of the world yet. Jesus does not want to become the king of the world by getting it from Satan. Jesus wants to become the king of the world by it being given to him by his father. When Jesus dies on the cross for our sin, 
It says that he was buried in the tomb in the grave for three days. After three days, he is raised to a resurrected life, lives on the earth another 40 days, and then it says he ascended into heaven, which means he was exalted to the throne, and that is when he became king. Jesus knew his father would feed him. Jesus knew his angels would protect him. Jesus knew he would get the kingdoms of the world. Jesus trusted in the promises of God, and he wanted all those things. He wanted to eat. He wanted angels. He wanted the kingdoms, but he did not want to get them from Satan. You have things that you want to feel that are good, and God will give them to you in his time. You have things that you've seen with your eyes that you want, and if God wants you to have them, he will give, them, he will give you everything that you need, but in his time. God wants to make you into somebody but he will make you into that somebody in his time, in his way. Do not gain it by Satan. Do not gain it by Satan. I remember one time as a teenager, me and my friends were out. um, We're doing like a a little in-town mission trip deal. And um, I think we were passing out flyers for an event. I remember going up to this one mansion. We went up to this mansion, and as we were walking up to this mansion, we saw these dogs run out of the backyard, like big dogs. Big dogs, right? And they were like kind of growling and barking at us. We couldn't tell if there was a fence, so we didn't really think about it. As we got up closer to the door, the dogs were getting closer to us. And so we're thinking, we're going to get inside this house. I mean, something's going to, they better let us in and give us some lemonade or something because these dogs are ready to attack and kill. And so we get real quickly up to the door and ring the doorbell as quickly as we could. And the people never came to the door. And as soon as we ran, rang the doorbell, the dogs went nuts and started running after us. The people didn't come to the door. So I remember we ran back to my car as quickly as we could, dogs chasing us. I don't remember what kind of dogs they were. It wasn't like, I'm not a pansy, not like little chihuahua dogs. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they They were big, ferocious dogs. And so they were chasing after us. I will never forget. I was the first one. The only way I could get in the car, they left the passenger door unlocked. Thank you, Jesus. Open up the passenger door, and the front seat was down so the last person could get out when we got out of the car. So the front seat was down. So I jumped into the back seat, and then three more guys came in and jumped on top of me just so we could get the door shut so the dogs would not chew us to bits, right? And so we are inside the car. I'm on the bottom. I have the keys to my car. Three guys on top of me, back seat, dogs are like on the windows, ah, you know, trying to like eat us alive. I mean, they literally want to kill us. And so we ran as fast as we could. And so I remember just, just getting people off me, getting the keys, getting the front seat, and getting out of there. In one sense, that's how we view temptation. View temptation as ferocious, vicious, destructive dogs, demons, animals, whatever, and resist Flee, get out of there. It's nothing to play with. You don't pet a drooling dog who sees you as his play toy, right? You don't do that. He will hurt you. He will hurt you. You don't want to pet him. But at the same time, I also want us to think about being like the dog. Being like the dogs. Temptation comes up to your house. Sin comes up to your house. Don't just be a pansy and and just flee and just run away you fight back. We make war. We engage war with the devil. We engage war through the gospel. Jesus has died for my sin. His blood has covered my sin. I can confess my sin, repent of my sin, turn of my sin. And here's the great thing. You have already sinned by the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. You already have. Jesus forgives. Jesus forgives. Jesus empowers you through the cross. Jesus empowers you through his blood that was shed for you. Jesus will work in you so that you will gain more and more strength against the temptation and the lusts of the devil. So be like Jesus. Fight off the temptations of Satan with the word of God. Be like Jesus in the way that we see here in this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, take every thought captive to obey Christ. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. That is, that is engaging in war and saying every thoughtful temptation that I have, I take it captive, I make it my slave, and I do not answer to it. In James 4, 7, 
Resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you.